The Heroes of Asgard Chapter 1 The Aesir Parts 1 through 6 Read by Christopher Soulsby of Vikings, Voyages, and Adventures Part 1 A Giant, a Cow, and a Hero In the beginning of ages there lived a cow whose breath was sweet and whose milk was bitter. This cow was called Althumla, and she lived all by herself on a frosty, misty plain, where there was nothing to be seen but heaps of snow and ice piled strangely over one another. Far away to the north it was night, far away to the south it was day. But all around where Althumla lay, a cold, grey twilight reigned. By and by, a giant came out of the dark north and lay down upon the ice near Althumla. You must let me drink of your milk, said the giant to the cow. And though her milk was bitter, he liked it well, and for him it was certainly good enough. After a little while, the cow looked all round her for something to eat, and she saw a very few grains of salt sprinkled over the ice, so she licked the salt, and breathed with her sweet breath, and then long golden locks rose out of the ice, and the southern day shone upon them, which made them look bright and glittering. The giant frowned when he saw the glitter of the golden hair, but Althumla licked the pure salt again, and a head of a man rose out of the ice. The head was more handsome than could be described, and a wonderful light beamed out of its clear blue eyes. The giant frowned still more when he saw the head, but Althumla licked the salt a third time, and then an entire man arose, a hero majestic in strength and marvelous in beauty. Now it happened that when the giant looked full in the face of that beautiful man, he hated him with his whole heart, and what was still worse, he took a terrible oath, by all the snows of Ganungagap, that he would never cease fighting until either he or Bur, the hero, should lie dead upon the ground. And he kept his vow. He did not cease fighting until Burr has fallen beneath his cruel blows. I cannot tell how it could be that one so wicked should be able to conquer one so majestic and so beautiful. But so it was, and afterwards, when the sons of the hero began to grow up, the giant and his sons fought against them too, and were very near conquering them many times. But there was of the sons of the heroes one of very great strength and wisdom, called Othin, who, after many combats, did at last slay the great old giant, and pierced his body through with his keen spear, so that the blood swelled forth in a mighty torrent, broad and deep, and all the hideous giant brood were drowned in it, excepting one, who ran away panting and afraid. After this, Othan called round him his sons, brothers, and cousins, and spoke to them thus, Heroes, we have won a great victory. Our enemies are dead, or have run away from us. We cannot stay any longer here, where there is nothing evil for us to fight against. The heroes looked round them at the words of Othan. North, south, east, and west, there was no one to fight against them anywhere, and they called out with one voice, It is well spoken, Othan. We follow you. Southward, answered Othan. Heat lies and northward night. From the dim east the sun begins his journey westward home. Westward home, shouted they all, and westward they went. Othan rode in the midst of them and they all paid to him reverence and homage as to a king and father. On his right hand rode Thor, Othan's strong, warlike eldest son. On his left hand rode Balthor, the most beautiful and exalted of his children, for the very light of the sun itself shone forth from his pure and noble brow. 
after him came Tyr the Brave, the silent Vitar, Hutter, who, alas, was born blind, Ermod, the Flying Word, Braki, Hunir, and many more mighty lords and heroes. And then came a shell chariot, in which sat Frigga, the wife of Othan, with all her daughters, friends, and tirewomen. Eleven months they journeyed westward, enlivening the way with cheerful songs and conversation, and at the twelfth new moon they pitched their tents upon a range of hills which stood near the borders of an inland sea. The greater part of one night they were disturbed by mysterious whisperings, which appeared to proceed from the sea coast and creep up the mountainside. But as Tyr, who got up half a dozen times and ran furiously about among the gorse and bushes, always returned saying that he could see no one. Frigga and her maidens at length resigned themselves to sleep, though they certainly trembled and started a good deal at intervals. Bothan lay awake all night, however, for he felt certain that something unusual was going to happen. And such proved to be the case, for in the morning before the tents were struck, a most terrific hurricane leveled the poles and tore in pieces the damask coverings, swept from over the water furiously up the mountain gorses, round the base of the hills, and up again all along their steep sides right in the faces of the heroes. Thor swung himself backwards and forwards and threw stones in every possible direction. Tyr sat down on the top of a precipice and defied the winds to displace him, whilst Balthor vainly endeavored to comfort his poor mother Frigga. But Othan stepped forth calm and unruffled, spread his arms toward the sky, and called out to the spirits of the wind, Cease, strange Vanir, for that was the name by which they were called. Cease your rough play and tell us in what manner we have offended you that you serve us thus. The winds laughed in a whispered chorus at the words of the brave king, and after a few low titterings sank into silence. But each sound in dying grew into a shape. One by one the strange, loose-limbed, uncertain forms stepped forth from caves, from gorges, dropped from the treetops, or rose out of the grass, each wind gust a separate fan. Then Njord, their leader, stood forward from the rest of them and said, We know, O mighty Othan, how you and your company are truly the Aesir, that is to say, the lords of the whole earth. Since you slew the huge wicked giant, we too are lords, not of the earth, but of the sea and air, and we thought to have glorious sport in fighting one against another. But if such be not your pleasure, let us instead of that shake hands. And as he spoke, Njord held out his long, cold hand, which was like a windbag to the touch. Othan grasped it heartily, as did all the Aesir, for they liked the appearance of the good-natured, gusty chief, whom they begged to become one of their company and live henceforth with them. To this, Njord consented, whistled goodbye to his kinfolk, and strode cheerfully along amongst his new friends. After this, they journeyed on and on steadily westward until they reached the summit of a lofty mountain called the Meeting Hill. There they all sat round in a circle and took a general survey of the surrounding neighborhood. As they sat talking together, Balthor looked up suddenly and said, Is it not strange, Father Othan, that we do not find any traces of that giant who fled from us and who escaped drowning in his father's blood? Perhaps he has fallen into Niflheim and so perished, remarked Thor. But Nir pointed northward, where the troubled ocean rolled and said, Yonder beyond that sea lies the snowy region of Jotunheim. It is there the giant lives, and builds cities and castles, and brings up his children, a more hideous brood even than the old one. How do you know that, Njord? asked Othan. I have seen him many times, answered Njord. 
both before I came to live with you and also since then, at night, when I have not been able to sleep and have made little journeys to Jotunheim to pass the time away. This is indeed terrible news, said Frigga, for the giants will come again out of Jotunheim and devastate the earth. Not so, answered Othin. Not so, my dear Frigga, for here upon this very hill we will build for ourselves a city from which we will keep guard over the poor earth with its weak men and women, and from whence we will go forth to make war upon Jotunheim. That is remarkably well said, Father Othin, observed Thor, laughing amidst his red beard. Tyr shouted and Vitar smiled, but said nothing. And then all the Aesir set to work with their whole strength and industry to build for themselves a glorious city on the summit of the mountain. For days and weeks and months and years they worked and never wearied. So strong a purpose was in them, so determined and powerful were they to fulfill it. Even Frigga and her ladies did not disdain to fetch stones in their marble wheelbarrows, or to draw water from the well in golden buckets, and then with delicate hands to mix the mortar upon silver plates. And so that city rose by beautiful degrees, stone above stone, tower above tower, height above height, until it crowned the hill. Then all the Aesir stood at a little distance and looked at it, and sighed from their great happiness. Towering at a giddy height in the center of the city rose Othan's seat, called Erthron, from whence he could see over the whole earth. On one side of the Erthron stood the Palace of Friends, where Frigga was to live. On the other rose the glittering Gladsheim, a palace roofed entirely with golden shields, and whose great hall, Valhalla, had a ceiling covered with spears, benches spread with coats of mail, and 540 entrance gates, through each of which 800 men might ride abreast. There is also a large iron smithy, situated on the eastern side of the city, where the Aesir might forge their arms and shape their armor. That night, they all supped in Valhalla, and drank to the health of their strong new home, the city of Asgard, as Bragi, their chief orator, said it ought to be called. Part 2. Airthrone, the Dwarfs, and the Light Elves In the morning, Ulthan mounted Airthrone, and looked over the whole earth whilst the Aesir stood all round waiting to hear what he thought about it. The earth is very beautiful, said Ulthan from the top of his throne. Very beautiful in every part, even to the shores of the dark North Sea. But alas, the men of the earth are puny and fearful. At this moment, I see a three-headed giant striding out of Jotunheim. He throws a shepherd boy into the sea and puts the whole of the flock into his pocket. Now he takes them out again, one by one, and cracks their bones as if they were hazelnuts, whilst all the time... Men look on and do nothing. Father, cried Thor in a rage, last night I forged for myself a belt, a glove, and a hammer, with which three things I will go forth alone to Jotunheim. Thor went and Oth and looked again. The men of the earth are idle and stupid, said Othin. There are dwarves and elves who live amongst them and play tricks which they cannot understand and do not know how to prevent. At this moment I see a husbandman sowing grains of wheat in the furrows, whilst the dwarf runs after him and changes them into stones. Again I see two hideous little beings who are holding underwater the head of one, the wisest of men, until he dies. They mix his blood with honey. They have put it into three stone jars and hidden it away. Then Othin was very angry with the dwarves, for he saw that they were bent on mischief. So he called to him Hermod, his flying word, and dispatched him with a message to the dwarves and light elves, 
to say that Othan sent his compliments and would be glad to speak with them in his palace of Gladsheim upon a matter of some importance. When they received Hermod's summons, the dwarves and light elves were very much surprised, not quite knowing whether to feel honored or afraid. However, they put on their protest manners and went clustering after Hermod like a swarm of ladybirds. When they were arrived in the great city, they found Othan descended from his throne and sitting with the rest of the Aesir in the judgment hall of Gladsheim. Hermod flew in, saluted his master, and pointed to the dwarves and elves hanging like a cloud in the doorway to show that he had fulfilled his mission. Then Othan beckoned the little people to come forward. Cowering and whispering, they peeped over one another's shoulders, now running on a little way into the hall, now back again, half curious, half afraid. And it was not until Othan had beckoned three times that they finally reached his footstool. Then Othan spoke to them in calm, low, serious tones about the wickedness of their mischievous propensities. Some of the very worst of them only laughed in a forward, hardened manner. But a great many looked up surprised and a little pleased at the novelty of serious words, while the light elves all wept for they were tender-hearted little beings. At length, Othan spoke to the two dwarves by name, whom he had seen drowning the wise man. Whose blood was it? He asked. That you mix with honey and put into jars. Oh, said the dwarves, jumping up into the air and clapping their hands. That was Kvasir's blood. Don't you know who Kvasir was? He sprang up out of the peace made between the Vanir and yourselves and has been wandering about these seven years or more. So wise he was that men thought he must be a god. Well, just now we found him lying in a meadow, drowned in his own wisdom. So we mixed his blood with honey and put it into three great jars to keep. Was that not well done, Othan? Well done, answered Othan. Well done, you cruel, cowardly little dwarves. I myself saw you kill him. For shame, for shame. And then Othan proceeded to pass sentence upon them all. Those who had been the most wicked, he said, were to live, henceforth, a long way underground, and were to spend their time in throwing fuel upon the great earth's central fire, whilst those who had only been mischievous were to work in the gold and diamond mines, fashioning precious stones and metals. They might all come up at night, Othan said, but must vanish at the dawn. Then he waved his hand, and the dwarfs turned round, shrilly chattering, scampering down the palace steps out of the city, over the green fields to their unknown, deep-buried earth homes. But the light elves still lingered, with upturned, tearful, smiling faces like sunshiny morning dew. And you, said Othan, looking them through and through with his serious eyes, and you... Oh, indeed, Othan, interrupted they, speaking all together in quick, uncertain tones. Oh, indeed, Oth Othan, we are not so very wicked. We have never done anybody any harm. Have you done anybody any good? Asked Othan. Oh, no, indeed, answered the Light Elves. We have never done anything at all. You may go, then, said Othan to live amongst the flowers and play with the wild bees and summer insects. You must, however, find something to do, or you will get to be mischievous like the dwarves. If only we had anyone to teach us, said the light elves, for we are such foolish little people. Othan looked around inquiringly upon the Aesir, but amongst them there was no teacher found for the silly little elves. Then he turned to Nyrd, who nodded his head good-naturedly and said, Yes, yes, I will see about it. And he then strode out of the judgment hall, right away through the city gates, and sat down upon the mountain's edge. After a while he began to whistle in a most alarming manner, louder and louder, in strong wild gusts, now advancing, 
now retreating. Then he dropped his voice a little lower and lower until it became a bird-like whistle, low, soft, enticing music like a spirit's call. And far away from the south a little fluttering answer came, sweet as the invitation itself, nearer and nearer until the two sounds dropped into one another. Then through the clear sky two forms came floating, wonderfully fair, a brother and sister. Their beautiful arms twined round one another, their golden hair bathed in sunlight and supported by the wind. My son and daughter, said Njord proudly to the surrounding Aesir, Frey and Freya, summer and beauty, hand in hand. When Frey and Freya dropped upon the hill, Njord took his son by the hand, led him gracefully to the foot of the throne, and said, Look here, dear brother lord, what a fair young instructor I have brought for your pretty little elves. Othin was very much pleased with the appearance of Frey, but before constituting him king and schoolmaster of the Light Elves, he desired to know what his accomplishments were and what he considered himself competent to teach. I am the genius of clouds and sunshine, answered Frey, and as he spoke the essence of a hundred perfumes were exhaled from his breath. I am the genius of clouds and sunshine, and if the Light Elves will have me for their king, I can teach them how to burst the folded buds, to set the blossoms, to pour sweetness into the swelling fruit, to lead the bees through the honey passages of the flowers, to make the single ear a stalk of wheat, to hatch birds' eggs, and teach the little ones to sing. All this and much more, said Frey. I know and will teach them. Then answered Othan, It is well. And Frey took his scholars away with him to Alfheim, which is in every beautiful place under the sun. Part 3. Niflheim Now in the city of Asgard dwelt one called Loki, who, though amongst the Aesir, was not of the Aesir, but utterly unalike to them. For to do wrong and leave the right undone was night and day, this wicked Loki's one unwearied aim. How he came amongst the Aesir no one knew, not even whence he came. Once, when Othin questioned him on the subject, Loki stoutly declared that there had been a time when he was innocent and noble purposed like the Aesir themselves, but that, after many wanderings up and down the earth, it had been his misfortune, Loki said, to discover the half-burnt heart of a woman. Since then, continued he, I became what you now see me, Othin. As this was too fearful a story for anyone to wish to hear twice over Othin, never questioned him again. Whilst the Aesir were building their city, Loki, instead of helping them, had been continually running over to Jotunheim to make friends amongst the giants and wicked witches of the place. Now, amongst the witches, there was one so fearful to behold in her sin and her cruelty, that one would have thought it impossible, even for such an one as Loki, to find any pleasure in her companionship. Nevertheless, so it was that he married her, and they lived together a long time, making each other worse and worse out of the abundance of their own wicked hearts, and bringing up their three children to be the plague, dread, and misery of mankind. These three children were just what they might have been expected to be from their parentage and education. The eldest was Jormungand, a monstrous serpent. The second, Fenrir, most ferocious of wolves. The third was Hela, half corpse, half queen. When Loki and his witch wife looked at their fearful progeny, they thought within themselves, What would the Aesir say if they could see? But they cannot see, said Loki, and lest they should suspect witch wife, I will go back to Asgard for a little while and salute old Father Othan bravely 
as if I had no secret here. So saying, Loki wished his wife good morning, bade her hide the children securely indoors, and set forth on the road to Asgard. But all the time he was traveling, Loki's children went on growing, and long before he had reached the lofty city, Jormungand had become so large that his mother was obliged to open the door to let his tail out. At first it hung only a little way across the road, but he grew. Oh, how fearfully Jormungand grew! Whether it was from sudden exposure to the air, I do not know, but in a single day he grew from one end of Jotunheim to the other, and early next morning began to shoot out in the direction of Asgard. Luckily, however, just at that moment, Othin caught sight of him, when from the top of Erethron, the eyes of this vigilant ruler were taking their morning walk. Now, said Othin, it is clear, Frigga, that I must remain in idleness no longer at Asgard. For monsters are bred up in Jotunheim, and the earth has need of me. So saying, descending instantly from Erethron, Othin went forth from Asgard's golden gates to tread the earth of common men, fighting to pierce through Jotunheim and slay its monstrous sins. In his journeyings, Othin mixed freely with the people of the countries through which he passed, shared with them toil and pleasure war, and grief, taught them out of his own large experience, inspired them of his noble thoughts, and exalted them by his example. Even to the oldest he could teach much, and in the evening, when the labors of the day were ended, and the sun cast slanting rays upon the village green, it was pleasant to see the sturdy village youths grouped round that noble chief, hanging open mouth upon his words as he taught them of his great fight with the giants of long ago, and then, pointing towards Jotunheim, explained to them how that fight was not yet over. For that giants and monsters grew round them on every side, and they too might do battle bravely, and be heroes and Aesir of the earth. One evening, after thus drinking in his burning words, they all trooped together to the village smithy, and Othin forged for them all night arms and armor, instructing them at the same time in their use. In the morning he said, Farewell, children. I have further to go than you can come, but do not forget me when I am gone, nor how to fight as I have taught you. Never cease to be true and brave, never turn your arms against one another and never turn them away from the giant and the oppressor. Then the villagers returned to their homes and their field labor, and Othan pressed on, through trackless, uninhabited woods, up silent mountains, over the lonely ocean, until he reached that strange, mysterious meeting place of sea and sky. There, brooding over the waters like a gray sea fog, sat Mimir, guardian of the well, where wit and wisdom lie hidden. Mimir, said Othan, going up to him boldly, let me drink of the waters of wisdom. Truly, Othan, answered Mimir, it is a great treasure that you seek, and one which many have sought before, but who, when they knew the price of it, turned back. Then replied Othan, I would give my right hand for wisdom willingly. Nay, rejoined the remorseless Mimir, it is not your right hand, but your right eye you must give. Othan was very sorry when he heard the words of Mimir, and yet he did not deem the price too great, for plucking out his right eye and casting it from him, he received in return a draught of the fathomless deep. As Othin gave back the horn into Mimir's hand, he felt as if there were a fountain of wisdom springing up within him, an inward light, for which you may be sure he never grudged having given his perishable eye. Now also 
He knew what it was necessary for him to do in order to become a really noble Asa, and that was to push on to the extreme edge of the earth itself and peep over into Niflheim. Othan knew it was precisely what he must do, and precisely that he did. Onward and northward, he went over ice-bound seas, through twilight, fog, and snow, right onward in the face of winds that were like swords until he came into the unknown land, where sobs and sighs and sad, unfinished shapes were drifting up and down. Then, said Othan thoughtfully, I have come to the end of all creation, and a little further on Niflheim must lie. Accordingly, he pushed on further and further until he reached the Earth's extremest edge, where, lying down and leaning over from its last cold peak, he looked into the gulf below. It was Niflheim. At first, Othan imagined that it was only empty darkness, but after hanging there, Three nights and days, his eye fell on one of Yggdrasil's mighty stems. Yggdrasil was the old earth tree, whose roots sprang far and wide from Jotunheim, from above, and this the oldest of the three, out of Niflheim. Othan looked upon its time-worn, knotted fibers, and watched how they were forever gnawed by Nithog, the envious serpent and his brood of poisonous diseases. Then he wondered what he should see next, and one by one the specters arose from Nastrand, the shore of corpses, arose and wandered pale, naked, shameless, and without a home. Then Othan looked down deeper into the abyss of abysses, and saw all its shapeless, nameless ills, whilst far below him, deeper than Nastrand, Yggdrasil, and Nithog roared Vergelmir, the boiling cauldron of evil. Nine nights and days this brave, wise Asa hung over Niflheim pondering. More brave and more wise, he turned away from it than when he came. It is true that he sighed often on his road thence to Jotunheim, but it is not always thus that wisdom and strength come to us weeping. Part 4. The Children of Loki When, at length, Othan found himself in the land of giants, frost giants, mountain giants, three-headed and wolf-headed giants, mountains and iron witches of every kind, he walked straight on, without stopping to fight with any one of them, until he came to the middle of Jurmungand's body. Then he seized the monster, growing fearfully, as he was all the time, and threw him headlong into the deep ocean. There Jormungand still grew, until, encircling the whole earth, he found that his tail was growing down his throat, after which he lay quite still, binding himself together, and neither Othan nor anyone else had been able to move him thence. When Othan had thus disposed of Jormungand, henceforth, called the Midgard Serpent, he went on to the house of Loki's wife. The door was thrown open, and the wicked witch mother sat in the entrance, whilst on one side crouched Fenrir, her ferocious wolf son, and on the other stood Hela, most terrible of monsters and women. A crowd of giants strode after Othan, curious to obtain a glance of Loki's strange children before they should be sent away. At Fenrir and the Witch Mother, they stared with great eyes, joyfully and savagely glittering. But when he looked at Ella, each giant became as pale as new snow, and cold with terror as a mountain of ice. Pale, cold, frozen, they never moved again. But a rugged chain of rocks stood behind Othan, and he looked on fearless and unchilled. Strange daughter of Loki, he said, speaking to Hela. You have the head of a queen, proud forehead, and large imperial eyes, but your heart is pulseless, and your cruel arms kill what they embrace. Without doubt, you have somewhere a kingdom. 
not where the sun shines and men breathe the free air, but down below in infinite depths, where bodiless spirits wander and the cast off corpses are cold. Then Othan pointed downwards toward Niflheim, and Hela sank right through the earth, downward, downward, to that abyss of abysses, where she ruled over spectres and made for herself a home called Helheim, nine lengthy kingdoms wide and deep. After this, Othan desired Fenrir to follow him, promising that if he became tractable and obedient and exchanged his ferocity for courage, he should not be banished as his brother and sister had been. So Fenrir followed, and Othan led the way out of Jotunheim, across the ocean, over the earth, until he came to the heavenly hills, which held up the southern sky tenderly in their glittering arms. There, half on the mountaintop and half in air, sat Heimdall, guardian of the tremulous bridge Bifrost, that arches from earth to heaven. Heimdall was a tall, white fan, with golden teeth and a wonderful horn called the Gjallar horn, which he generally kept hidden under the tree Yggdrasil, but when he blew it, the sound went out into all worlds. Now, Othan had never been introduced to Heimdall, had never even seen him before, but he did not pass him by without speaking on that account. On the contrary, being altogether most struck by his appearance, he could not refrain from asking him a few questions. First, he requested to know whom he had the pleasure of addressing. Secondly, who his parents were, and what his education had been. And thirdly, how he explained his present circumstances and occupation. My name is Heimdall, answered the guardian of Bifrost, and the son of nine sisters am I, born in the beginning of time at the boundaries of the earth. I was fed on the strength of the earth and the cold sea. My training moreover was so perfect that I now need no more sleep than a bird. I can see for a hundred miles around me as well by night as by day. I can hear the grass growing and the wool on the backs of sheep. I can blow mightily my horn Gialar and I forever guard the tremulous bridgehead against monsters giants, iron witches, and dwarves. Then Othan asked gravely, Is it also forbidden to the Aesir to pass this way, Heimdall? Must you guard Bifrost also against them? Assuredly not, answered Heimdall. All Aesir and heroes are free to tread its trembling, many-colored pavement, and they will do well to tread it. For above the arch's summit, I know that the Urta Fountain Springs rises and falls in a perpetual glitter, and by its sacred waters the Nornir dwell. Those three mysterious mighty maidens, through whose cold fingers run the golden threads of time. Enough, Heimdall, answered Othan. Tomorrow we will come. Part 5 Bifrost, Urta, and the Nords. Othan departed from Heimdall and went on his way, Fenrir obediently following, though not now much noticed by his captor, who pondered over the new wonders which he had heard. Bifrost, Urta, and the Nords. What can they mean? Thus pondering and wandering he went, ascended Asgard's hill, walked through the golden gates of the city into the palace of Gladsheim, and into the hall of Valhalla, where just then the Aesir and Usunjur were assembled at their evening meal. Uthun sat down at the table without speaking, and still absent and meditative, proceeded to carve the great boar Seyrimnir, which every evening eaten was every morning whole again. No one thought of disturbing him by asking any questions, for they saw that something was on his mind, and the Aesir were well-bred, 
It is probable, therefore, that the supper would have been concluded in perfect silence if Fenrir had not poked his nose in at the doorway, just opposite to the seat of the lovely Freya. She, genius of beauty as she was, and who had never in her whole life seen even the shadow of a wolf, covered her face with her hands and screamed a little, which caused all the Aesir to start and turn around in order to see what was the matter. But Othan directed a reproving glance at the ill-mannered Fenrir, and then gave orders that the wolf should be fed. After which, concluded he, I will relate my adventures to the assembled Aesir. That is all very well, Asa Othan, answered Frey. But who, let me ask, is to undertake the office of feeding yon hideous and unmannerly animal? That will I joyfully, cried Tyr, who liked nothing better than an adventure, and then seizing a plate of meat from the table, he ran out of the hall, followed by Fenrir, who howled and sniffed and jumped up at him in the most impatient, un like manner. After the wolf was gone, Freya looked up again, and when Tyr was seated once more, Othan began. He told them of everything that he had seen, and done, and suffered, and at last of Heimdall, that strange white fan, who sat upon the heavenly hills and spoke of Bifrost and Urda and the Norns. The Aesir were very silent while Othan spoke to them, and were deeply and strangely moved by this conclusion to his discourse. The Norns, repeated Freya, the fountain of Urd, the golden threads of time. Let us go, my children, she said, rising from the table. Let us go and look at these things. But Othan advised that they should wait until the next day, as the journey to Bifrost and back again could easily be accomplished in a single morning. Accordingly, the next day the Aesir and Osinjor all rose with the sun and prepared to set forth. Njur came from Nuatun, the mild seacoast, which he had made his home, and with continual gentle puffings out from his wide breezy mouth, he made their journey to Bifras so easy and pleasant that they all felt a little sorry when they caught the first glitter of Heimdall's golden teeth. But Heimdall was glad to see them, glad at least for their sakes. He thought it would be so good for them to go and see the Norns. As far as he himself was concerned, he never felt dull alone. On the top of those bright hills, how many meditations he had. Looking far and wide over the earth, how much he saw and heard. Come already, said Heimdall to the Aesir, stretching out his long white hands to welcome them. Come already. Ah, this is Njord's doing. How do you do, cousin? said he for Njord and Heimdall were related. How sweet and fresh it is up here, remarked Frigga, looking all around and feeling that it would be polite to say something. You are very happy, sir, continued she, in having always such fine scenery about you and in being the guardian of such a bridge. And in truth, Frigga might well say such a bridge, for the like of it was never seen on the ground. Trembling and glittering it swung across the sky, up from the top of the mountain to the clouds and down again into the distant sea. Be frost, be frost, exclaimed the Aesir wonderingly, and Heimdall was pleased at their surprise. At the arch's highest point, said he, pointing upward, rises the fountain of which I spoke. Do you wish to see it today? That we do indeed, cried all the Aesir in a breath. Quick, Heimdall, and unlock the bridge's golden gate. Then Heimdall took all his keys out and fitted them into the diamond lock till he found the right one. And the gate flew open with a sound at the same time sad and cheerful, like the dripping of leaves after a thunder shower. The Aesir pressed in, but as they pressed him, Heimdall laid his hand upon Thor's shoulder and said, I am very sorry, Thor, but it cannot be helped. You must go to the fountain alone by another way, 
for you are so strong and heavy that if you were to put your foot on Bifrost, either it would tremble in pieces beneath your weight, or take fire from the friction of your iron heels. Yonder, however, are two river clouds, called Kurt and Urt, through which you can wade to the sacred earth, and you will assuredly reach it in time, though the waters of the clouds are strong and deep. At the words of Heimdall, Thor fell back from the bridge's head, vexed and sorrowful. Am I to be sent away then, and have to do disagreeable things? said he. Just because I am so strong? After all, what are Urta and the Norns to me? And Kurmt and Urmt? I will go back to Asgard again. Nay, Thor, said Othan. I pray you, do not anything so foolish. Think again, I beseech you, what it is that we are going to see and hear. Kurmt and Urmt lie before you as Bifrost before us. It is yonder above both that we go. Neither can it matter much, Thor, whether we reach the fountain of Urt over Bifrost or through the cloud. Then Thor blushed with shame at his own weakness, which had made him regret his strength. And without any more grumblings or hanging back, he plunged into the dreadful river clouds, whose dark vapors closed around him and covered him. He was hidden from sight and the Aesir went on their way over the glittering bridge. Daintily and airily they trode over it, they swung themselves up the swinging arch, they reached its summit on a pale bright cloud. Thor was there already waiting for them, drenched and weary but cheerful and bold. Then altogether they knocked at the door of the pale bright cloud. It blew open and they passed in. Oh, then what did they see? Looking up to an infinite height through the purple air, they saw towering above them Yggdrasil's fairest branches, leafy and of a tender green, which also stretched far and wide. But though they looked long, the Aesir could distinguish no topmost bough, and it almost seemed to them that from somewhere up above, this mighty earth tree must draw another root, so firmly and so tall it grew. On one side stood the palace of the Norns, which was so bright that it almost blinded them to look at it, and on the other the Urta fountain plashed its cool waters, rising, falling, glittering, as nothing ever glitters on this side the clouds. Two ancient swans swam under the fount, and around it sat three. Ah, how shall I describe them? Urd, Verthandi, Skuld. They were mighty, they were willful, and one was veiled. Sitting upon the doomstead, they watched the water as it rose and fell, and passed golden threads from one to another. Verdandi plucked them with busy fingers from Skuld's reluctant hand, and wove them in and out quickly, almost carelessly. For some she tore and blemished, and some she cruelly spoiled. Then Ur took the woof away from her smoothed its rough places, and covered up some of the torn, gaping holes. But she hid away many of the bright parts too, and then rolled it all round her great roller, Oblivion, which grew thicker and heavier every moment. And so they went on, Verdandi drawing from Skuld, and Urd from Verdandi. But whence Skuld drew her separate bright threads, no one could see. She never seemed to reach the end of them, and neither of the sisters ever stopped or grew weary of her work. The Aesir stood apart watching, and it was a great sight. They looked in the face of Urd and fed on wisdom. They studied the countenance of Verdandi and drank bitter strength. They glanced through the veil of Skuld and tasted hope. At length, with full hearts, they stole away silently, one by one, out by the pale, open door, recrossed the bridge, and stood once more by the side of Heimdall on the heavenly hills. Then they went home again. Nobody spoke as they went. But ever afterwards, it was an understood thing that the Aesir should fare to the doomstead of the Nornir once in every day. Part 6. Othaedrir 
Now upon the day it happened that Othan sat silent by the well of Urd, and in the evening he mounted Airthrone with a troubled mind. Allfather could see into dwarf home from his high place, as well as over man's world. His keen eye pierced also the mountains and darkness of Jotunheim. On this evening, a tear, the fate sister's gift, swam across his vision, and behold, is that an answering tear which he sees down there in dwarf home, large, luminous, golden, in the dark heart of the earth? Can dwarfs weep? exclaimed Allfather, surprised as he looked a second and a third time, and went on looking. Fialar and Galar, the cunning dwarfs who had killed Kvasir, were kneeling beside the tear. Is it theirs? said Allfather again. And do they repent? No, it was not a tear. Othan knew it at last. More precious still, it was Kvasir's blood. Golden mead now, because of the honey drops from Earth's thousand bees and flowers, which these thoughtless mischief schemers, but wonder workers had poured into it. It is three, said Othan, three precious draughts. Othairir is its name, and now the dwarfs will drink it, and the life and the light, and the sweetness of the world will be spilt, and the heart of the world will die. But the dwarfs did not drink it. They could only sip it a little, just a drop or two at a time. The father of hosts watched how they were amusing themselves. Fialar and Galar and the whole army of the little black-faced crooked-limbed creatures were tilting the big jars over to one side, whilst first one and then another sucked the skim of their golden sweetness, smacking their lips after it, grinning horribly, leaping up into the air with strange gestures, falling backwards with shut eyes some of them as if asleep, tearing at the earth and the stones of their cavern homes others like wild beasts, rolling forth beautiful, senseless, terrible words. It was Fialar and Galar who did that, and behold in a little while, one after another, the dwarfs gathered round them as they spoke, and listened open-mouthed, with clenched fists stamping and roaring applause, until at last they seized the weapons that lay near cocked their earth caps, each alit with a colored star, and marched in warlike fashion, led on by Fialar and Galar, straight up through their cavernous ways to Manheim, and across it into the frozen land. Giant Vafthrithnir, that ancient talker, he who sits ever in his hall weaving new and intricate questions for the gods, saw them, and looked up toward the brooding heavens, he exchanged glances with the father of hosts. But the dwarfs did not come near Fafthrithnir's halls. They never looked aside at him, nor up to the air throne of the Asa, only rushed heedlessly on till they stumbled over the giant Gilling, who was taking a nap upon the green bank of Ifing. Ifing looks a, Ifing looks a lazy stream. One could hardly see the first sight that it flows at all. But it flows, and it flows quietly, unceasingly, and is so deep that neither god nor giant has ever been able to fathom it. It is, in fact, that stream which divides forever the Jotuns from the gods, and of it Othan himself once said, Open shall it run throughout all time, on that stream no ice shall be. So the dwarfs found Gilling asleep. They knew how deep Ifing was. They knew that if they could once roll the giant Gilling in there, he would never get out again. And then they should have done something worth speaking about. I have killed a giant, each dwarf might say, and who knows, even the Aesir might begin to feel a little afraid of them. It all comes from drinking Kvasia's blood, they said. And then with their thousand little swords and spears and sticks and stones, they worked away until they had plunged the sleeping giant into the stream. Allfather's piercing eyes saw it all, and how the silly dwarfs jumped and danced about afterward, and praised themselves, and defied the whole world, gods, giants, and men. It is not for us, 
they said. Any more to run away from Skinfax, the, the shining horse that draws day over humankind, whose mane sheds light instead of dew. We will dance before him and crown ourselves with gold, as the gods and as men do every morning. The ground they stood upon began to shake under them, and an enormous darkness grew between them and the sky. Then the dwarfs stopped their rejoicing as if a spell had fallen upon them, dropping their weapons, huddling close to one another, cowering, whispering. Giant Suttung, son of that Giling whom they had just slain, was coming upon them in great fury to avenge his father's death. They were dreadfully frightened. Giant Giling asleep had been easy to manage, but a giant awake? A giant angry? They were not the same dwarfs that they had seemed half an hour ago. And so it happened that they quite easily let Suttung carry them all off to a low rock in the sea, which was dry just then, but would be washed over by the morning tide. There you are, said Suttung as he threw them all down upon the rock. And there you shall stay until the hungry grey wave comes. But then we shall be drowned, they all screeched at once and the sea mews started from their nets ashore and swooped round the lonely rock and screeched as well. Suttung strode back to the shore and sat on the high rocks over the sea mews' nests and poked his fingers into the nests and played with the grey-winged birds and paddled his feet in the breakers and laughed and echoed the dwarfs and the sea mews. Drowned, drowned, yes, then you will be drowned! Then the doors whispered together and consulted. They all talked at once, and every one of them said a different thing. For they were, in fact, a little intoxicated still by the sips they had taken of Oterir. At last Fialar and Galar said the same, same thing, over so often that the others began to listen to them. The sky is getting quite grey, they said, and the stars are going out and Skinfaxi is coming. And the waves are gathering and gathering and gathering. Hoarse are the voices of the Sea King's daughters. But why do we all sit chattering here instead of getting away as we might easily do if we did but bribe the giant Suttung with a gift? Yes, yes, yes! shouted the silly little people. Shall we give him our cap jewels? Or our swords? Or our pickaxes? Or our lanterns? Or shall we promise to make him a necklace out of the fire of the sun and the flowers of earth? Or shall we build him a ship of ships? Nonsense! shouted Fialar and Galar. How should a giant care for such things as these? Our swords could not help him. He does not want pickaxes nor lanterns who lives amongst the mountain snows, nor ships who can stride across the sea, nor necklaces. Bah! A giant loves life. He drinks blood. He is greedy besides and longs to taste the gold meat of the gods. Then all the dwarfs shouted together, Let us give him our gold mead, our wondrous drink, Othirir, our Kavasia's blood in the three stone jars. Othan heard from the air throne's blue deep. He brooded over the scene. The sweetness and the life and the light of the world then, he said, are to satiate the giant's greediness for food and blood. And it was for mankind that he became terror in the trembling height. All father feared nothing for the gods at that time. Could he not pierce into Jotunheim and Svartheim and Mannheim alike? Suttung heard also from the rock. And what may this Othrerir be worth that you boast of so much? He shouted to the dwarves. Wisdom and labor and fire and life and love. Tut, 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 answered Suttung. Does it taste well? Honey and wine like the blood of a god and the milk of the earth. Then Suttung got up slowly from the rock, pressing it down with his hand into two little dells as he rose and strode to the island from which he took up all the dwarves that he grasped. They clinging to his fists and wrists like needles to a magnet and with one swoop threw them ashore just as the hungry waves began to lap and wash about the dwarf's peril. So the dwarfs jumped and leaped and laughed and sang and chattered again and ran on before Suttung to fetch him the golden mead, Othrerir. 
three big stone jars, all full. The spirit mover, the peace offer, the peace kiss. Sutung lifted the lids and looked into the jars. It doesn't look much, he said. And after all, I don't know that I shall care to taste it. But I will take the jars home to my daughter Gunloth, and they will make a pretty treasure for her to keep. Othan brooded over the scene. It was a grey winter's morning in Jotunheim. Ice over all the rivers, snow upon the mountains, rhyme writing across the woods, weird horror letters straggling over the bare branches of the trees, writing such as giants and gods can read, but men see it only as pearl drops of the cold. Sutung could read it well enough as he trudged along to his mountain home. Better than he had ever read it before, for he was not bearing upon his shoulders the wondrous Kvasir's life-giving blood, Othrergir. Othan read it. This is ominous, Othan. This is dark. Shall the gold mead be made captive in frozen halls? For behold, the life tier becomes dark in the dark land, as Suttung's huge door opened to let him in, him and his treasure, and then closed upon them both. Suttung gave the mead to his daughter, Gunluth, to keep, to guard it well, and the heart of Manheim trembled. It was empty and cold. Then Othan looked north and south and east and west over the whole world. Come to me, he said, and the two swift-winged ravens flew towards him. It seemed as if they came out of nothing, for in a moment they were not there and they were there. Their names were Hugen and Munen, and they came from the ends of earth where Othan sent them every morning. Every evening he was wont to say of them, I fear me for Hugen, lest he come not back, but much more for Munin. Yet they never failed to come back, both of them. At the dim hour in which they recounted to the Father of Hosts the history of the day that was past, and the hope of the day that was to come. On this evening, Munin's song was so terrible that only the strength of a god could possibly have endured to its end. Hugen struck another note profounder and sweet. Then said Othan, when cadence after cadence had filled his ears, and he had descended from Erthron. Night is the time for new counsels. Let each one reflect until the morrow who is able to give advice helpful to the Aesir. But when the jeweled horse ran up along the sky, from whence his mane shed light over the whole world, when giants and giantesses and ghosts and dwarves crouched, beneath Yggdrasil's outer root, when Heimdall ran up Bifrost and blew mightily his horn in heaven's height. There was only one found who gave counsel to Othan, and that was Othan himself. Othrerir, he said, which is a god gift, must come up to men's earthly dwellings. Go forth, Hugin, go forth, Munin, said the Asa, and he also went forth alone none knowing where he went, nor how. So Othan journeyed for a long, long while towards Suttung's hall, across the windy, wintry ways of Jotunheim, seeking well before him the yellow mead as he went, through rocks and woods and rivers, and through night itself, until at last it happened that Othan came into a meadow upon a summer morning in Giantland. Nine slaves were mowing in the meadow, wetting some old rusty scythes which they had, working heavily, for they were senseless fellows, and the summer day grew faster upon them than their labor grew to completion. You seem heavy-hearted, said Othan to the thralls, and they began to explain to him how rusty and old their scythes were, and that they had no whetstone to sharpen them with. Upon this Othan offered to wet their scythes for them with his whetstone. And no sooner had he done so than the scythes became so sharp that they could have cut stones as easily as grass. Instead of mowing, however, the thralls began to clamor round Othan, beseeching him to give his whetstone to them. Give it to me! Give it to me! Give it to me! cried one and another. And all the time Othan stood quietly amongst them, 
throwing his whetstone up in the air and catching it as it fell. Then the thralls tried if they could catch it, leaning stupidly across one another with their sides in their hands. Was Allfather surprised at what happened next? He could hardly have been, but he was sorry when looking down as the whetstone fell, he saw all the thralls lying dead at his feet, killed by each other's sharpened weapons. This is an evil land, said Othan, as he looked down on the dead thralls, and I am a bringer of evil into it. So he journeyed on till he came to the house of Suttung's brother, Baogi. Othan asked Baogi to give him night's lodging, and Baogi, who knew no more than the thralls had done who this traveler was, consented and began to talk to Othan of the troubles he was in. This is hay harvest, he said, as you must have seen walking here through the meadows, and I have a mighty field to gather in, but how to do it puzzles me, because my nine slaves whom I sent out sound and well this morning all fell dead about the middle of the day. How they managed it I can't imagine, and it puts me out sadly, for summer days don't last long in Jotunheim. Well, said Othan, I'm not a bad hand at mowing, and I don't mind undertaking to do the work of nine thralls for you, Baogi, for a certain reward you may give me, if you will. What is that? inquired Baogi eagerly. A draught from that golden mead, Othrairir, which Suttung obtained from the dwarves, and which his daughter Gunloth keeps for him. Oh, that, said Baogi, isn't so good as my home brood for a thirsty mower. But you shall have it. It is a bargain between us. So Othan worked for Baogi the whole summer through with the labor of nine instead of with the labor of one. And when the last field was reaped and wintry mists were gathering, the god and the giant began to talk over their bargain again. We will come together to Suttung's house, said Baogi. And my brother shall give you the draught which you desire so much. But when the two came to Suttung's house and asked him for the mead, Suttung was exceedingly angry and would not hear a word about it from either of them. You don't drink it yourself, brother, pleaded Baogi, although you might do so every day if you liked without asking anybody's leave or doing one stroke of work for it. Whilst this man has toiled night and day for nine months that he might taste it only once, for three years for us giants, nevertheless, answered Suttung. And well does my daughter Gunloth guard it from dwarves and from men, from specters, from Usinjur, and from Aesir. Have I not sworn that so it shall be guarded by all the snows of Jotunheim, and by the stormy waves, and by the yawning chasm of the abyss? Then Baoki knew that nothing more was to be said, and he advised Othan to go back with him at once and drink beer. But Othan was not to be turned from his purpose so easily. You promised me a draught of the gold mead, Baoki, he said. And I can see it through the rock in its three treasure jars. Sit down by me and look through the rock till you can see it too. So Othan and Baoki sat down together and pierced the rock with their glances all that day until they had made a small hole in it. And at night, when Suttung was asleep, and when Gundloth was asleep, and whilst the gold mead shone steadily in the heart of the cave, Othan looked up towards Asgard and said, Little get I here by silence, of a well-assumed form, I will make good use, for few things fail the wise. And then this strong wise Asa picked up from the ground the little mean wriggling form of a worm, and put it on and crept noiselessly into the hole which he and Baoki had made. The giant's ways are under me. The giant's ways are over me. But when he had got quite through to the inner side, to Gunluth's room, Othan took his proper form again. I see her upon her golden seat, he said as he looked upon the sleeping Gunluth where she lay and Othan was surprised to see a giant maid so beautiful. 
surprised and sorry, for I must leave her weeping. He mused, How shall she not weep, defrauded of her treasure in an evil land? And Othin loved and pitied the beautiful maiden so much that he would have returned to Asgard without the mead had that been possible. Alas, for Gunluth, it was less possible than ever since Allfather had seen her. For Gunluth awoke in the light of Odin's glance and trembled. She did not know why. She did not know at first that he was an Asa, but when he asked her for her treasure, she could not keep it from him. She could not have kept anything from him. She rose from her golden couch. Her blue eyes melted into the tenderness of a summer sky. She undid the bars and bolts and coverings of Othrerir, which she had guarded so faithfully till then, and knelt before Othan, and stretched her hands toward him and said, Drink, for I think you are a god. A draught, a draught, a long deep draught, and the spirit of the Asa was shaken through its height and through its depth, and again a draught of love flowing forth to the outermost, to the abysses, and one draught again, peace, inrushing still. Why are you weeping so, Gunloth? Oh, why do you weep? Did you not give him your whole treasure? Your fervent love, your whole soul. You kept nothing back, and Othrerir is forever the inheritance of the gods. The dwarfs sold it for their lives. The giantess lost it of her love. Gods win it for the world. It is for the Aesir, it is for men, said Othin. It is Othin's booty, it is Othin's gift. And immediately in haste to share it, the Asa spread eagle's wings and flew far up, away from the barren rock and the black, cold halls of Suttung towards his heavenly home. Alas for Gunluth, she has lost her treasure and her Asa too. How cold the cavern is now in which she sits. Her light is gone out. She is left alone. She is left weeping upon her golden throne. But Othan soared upwards, flew on toward Asgard, and the Aesir came crowding upon the city's jeweled walls to watch his approach. And soon they perceived that two eagles were flying towards the city, the second pursuing the first. The pursuing eagle was Suttung, who, as soon as he found out that his mead was gone, and that Othin, eagle-wise, had escaped his vengeance, spread also his eagle's wings, very strong and very swift in pursuit. Suttung appeared to gain upon Othin. Frigga feared for her beloved. The Usinjur and the Aesir watched breathlessly. Frost giants and storm giants came crowding up from the depths to see. Does Othin return amongst the gods? They asked. Or will Suttung destroy him? It was not possible, however, that the struggle should end in any way but one. The divine bird dropped from its height upon his hall. The High One's Hall. And then there burst from him such a flood of song that the widest limits of Aesir land were overflowed. Some sounds even spilt themselves upon the common earth. It is poetry herself. It is Othan's booty. It is Othan's gift. It is for the Aesir. It is for the Aesir. Said a thousand and a thousand songs. And for men, answered Allfather with his million ringing, changing voices. It is for men. Such as have sufficient wit to make a right use of it, said Loki. And this was the first discordant note that troubled Asgard after Othan's return. In this tale, or rather in this arrangement of tales, most of the chief gods are named, and one or two of the myths concerning them are hinted at. The sweet mixture made out of Kvasir's blood and given to the giant Suttung to keep was called, as we have seen, Othrerir. It was kept in three jars, and though the name of it as a whole was Othrerir, the portion in the second jar was also called Son, and in the third jar, Bon. 
Otrerir is mentioned in two of the Elder Edda songs, and in the Younger Edda, an account is given of Othan bringing it up to Asgard. Neither of the Eddas, it must be remarked, mentions the banishment of the dwarves and elves in connection with Kvasia's blood. The golden mead, Othrerir, is supposed to signify poetry. The first symbol of the name means mind and feeling. Othrerir, spirit mover. Son, meaning reconciliation, or the offer of peace. Bon, means the acceptance of peace. These two letter names referring to the origin of Kvasir, who was created out of the peace made between the Aesir and the Fanir. Simrok thinks that Kvasir, meaning fermentation, implies the excitement necessary to poetry. That Othin, laboring for a draught of the precious mead, suggests that poetry can only be possessed through labor, and that his receiving it from the beautiful Gunlod expresses it as the gift and crown of love. Othan drinking it three times signifies the intensity through which poetry lives. It is intoxication. Othan appears to have felt very wise after his three draughts, for he is made to say, Potent songs I learned, and a draught obtained, of the precious mead. Then I began to bear fruit, and to know many things. Word by word, I sought out words. Fact by fact, I sought out facts. Runes I graved, very large characters, very potent characters. One of the Edda songs is called the High One's Lay, so we may conclude it was inspired by Sotung's Mead, one or two of the strophes are worth quoting, just to show what the lay is like. The following are selected from different places and have no connection with one another. At eve the day is to be praised, a sword after it is proved, ice after it has passed away, beer after it is drunk, cattle die, kindred die, we ourselves also die. But I know one thing that never dies, Judgment on each one dead. I was once young, I was journeying alone, and lost my way. Rich I thought myself when I met another. Man is the joy of man. Here is a contrast. Two are adversaries, the tongue is the bane of the head. Under every cloak I expect a hand. A firmer friend no man ever gets than great sagacity. Givers and requiters are longest friends. A worse provision no man can carry than too much beer bibing. So good is not, as it is said, beer for the sons of men. My garments in a field I gave away to two wooden men, heroes they seemed to be when they got cloaks. Much too early I came to many places, but too late to others. The beer was drunk or not ready. The disliked seldom hits the moment. We often read of Othan disguising himself, sometimes in animal, more frequently in human form. He wanders about the world and very curious stories are told about his adventures. Sometimes he asks his wife's leave before setting off. Counsel thou me now, Frigg, as I long to go, an all-wise giant to visit. And Frigg answers, In safety mayest thou go, in safety return, in safety on thy journeyings be. May thy wit avail thee, when thou, father of men, shalt hold converse with the giant. But Othan was not obliged to take long journeyings himself when he wanted to know what was going on in the world. He had, as we have seen, two messengers whom he sent out daily, the ravens, Hugin and Munin, thought and memory. Hugin and Munin, each dawn take their flight, earth fields over. I fear me for Hugin, lest he come not back, but much more for Munin. Perhaps because of Munin being memory, he was expected to fail first. Othan, looking over into Niflheim, is thus alluded to in an old song. 
the god is made to say. I know that I hung on a wind-rocked tree. Nine whole nights downward I peered to runes applied myself. Wailing learnt them, then fell down thence. The next strophe tells how he got the draught of the precious mead. In this myth it seems as if Othan hung upon Yggdrasil. Simrak mentions a singular little German tale which may possibly hold some connection with it, and has evidently an eastern origin. A man, it says, in danger of falling into a brook, held fast with one hand to a shrub while his feet rested on a small piece of grass. In this predicament he saw two mice, day and night, gnawing at the root of the shrub, and the grass undermined by four worm heads. Then a dragon appeared and opened his mouth to swallow him up, whilst an elephant reached his trunk towards him. At the same time he seized with eager mouth some honey which dropped from the tree. Simrok says that the eating of the honey is like people being occupied with frivolity whilst the world battle goes on, but may not the story possibly have a little to do with Othin and Yggdrasil and Othrerir? We heard before that Othin was connected with air. We see him here on his high throne looking over all worlds, wandering over the earth, piercing even to the deep, giving his eye to Mimir for wisdom, consequently having only one eye, one sun in heaven. Some suppose that the pledged eye means the setting of the sun nightly. Mimir, who guards the well, means the remembrance of the origin of things which was water the strange waves that flowed into Ginnungogap. An odd story is told of Mimir, who was originally a giant though received by the Aesir, namely that he was sent as a hostage to the Fanir, who cut off his head and sent it back to Othan. The head remained so wise that the father of the gods used to consult it on all important occasions, as the lay says. Othan speaks with Mim's head. Heimdall, guardian of the bridge, whose exact name was Trembling Rest, was perhaps the most important of the Vanir. He is represented in one old lay as traveling about the world by himself, which is a sure sign that he was originally a very great god indeed. Upon this journey he became the father of the three races of men, the Thralls, the Karls, and the Jarls. The way in which these three races are compared with one another is very curious. The thralls are described with shriveled skin, knotty knuckles, thick fingers, hideous faces, curved backs, and protruding heels. They were made to erect fences, manure fields, tend swine, keep goats, and dig turf. The Karl's children are said to be clothed in linen, to be ruddy-headed and have twinkling eyes and they grow up to tame oxen, make plows, build houses, make carts and farm. But the favored, useless Jarls, light of hair, bright cheeks, eyes piercing as a serpent's, grow up to shake the field, to brandish spears, horses to ride, dogs to slip, swords to draw, swimming to practice. Heimdall keeps the bridge alike from Thunder God and Frost Giants. But at Ragnarok, the swarthy god Surtur, who lives on the borders of Muspelheim, will ride over it and shatter it to pieces. Heimdall's horn is mentioned. This is supposed to mean the crescent moon, and Mimir's drinking horn also means the moon. Later, when the stories of the gods had dwindled down into weird, unholy legends, and Othan had sunk into the wild huntsman. The crescent moon was his horn. One of Heimdall's names was Ermin, and this means shining. The Milky Way is called Ermenstrasse, or Ermin's Way, and the wild hunt was supposed to go over the Milky Way, which is also called Valdemar's Way in Denmark, and Valdemar is a common name of hunters. Loki and his children in these myths are evidently the destructive principle, either physically or morally, or both. Jormungand and Fenrir are much alike. Jormungand means the universal wolf, 
and of Fenrir, it is said, he goes about revengeful, with open jaws devouring all things. Hela had originally another side of her character, but here as Loki's daughter, she has only the nature of his other children. The myth about Loki finding the half-burnt heart of a woman is said to be a very young one, and so perhaps it is not worth considering the meaning of. The god about whom, next to Othin, most stories are told is Thor. In some parts of the north, he was a more prominent object of worship even than Othin, Norway and Iceland being especially devoted to his service. Let us now hear how Thor went to Jotunheim. Return for the tale in chapter 2.